today we're going to be looking at Jesus' kid brother, Jude, and see if we can't glean a little bit of a different kind of wisdom as we kick off um, this new year and as we look at what it means to start well. What it means to be, I don't know about you, I'm a bit of a goal setter. Um, my goals have goals, and uh, I'm, I'm a, like, I'm, I'm kind of maniacal about this. And so uh, I get to the end of the year, and I have a little ritual uh, during the last week of the year. Now, amongst those things are watch all of The Lord of the Rings um, and The Hobbit, extended edition. There was a lot of TV, okay. Um, and uh, higher and holier is review my goals, that I said at the beginning of the year, and see how I did. Now, usually, on that list of goals is uh, something like, be a better Christian, be a better dad, follow Jesus better, or something. And, and I assume if you belong to Team Jesus this morning, if you're an actual Christian, real life, we dipped you in the horse trough and everything. If you've never been here on a baptism Sunday, you didn't get that. But we dip people in a horse trough. It's amazing. Um, and... Uh, so if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, then probably you've got a goal to know God better, to be closer to God. Like if God is over there, then you want to be a little closer, right? Which is almost certain to not happen without an extraordinary amount of intentionality on your part. There's a weird thing about being Protestant, and in case you're new to this thing, that's what you are because you're not Catholic, and that's really the only other viable option except Orthodox, and that's complicated. All right, you're Protestant. And we're people who believe that we, we come into relationship with Jesus, we are saved by grace through faith. We're really, really just absolutely amazed at God's unstoppable grace to save a sinner like me. But sometimes when we get to the grace thing, we imagine grace as like this, you know, barca lounger, this, this recliner, this thing like we're, we've been saved by grace, and so all we need to do is just sit down in our nice, comfy leather grace chair, kick it back, and like, ah, oh, everything's going to be fine. And that is nothing like what the scriptures describe the grace of God to be. It has nothing like the way the scriptures describe closeness with God to be obtained. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about what it means to contend for closeness with God. Contending for closeness with God. All because of and, and enabled by His grace. But contending nonetheless. And so we're going to read... The very beginning and the very end of Jude's book, which is a really generous use of the word book. It's like seven paragraphs long. But here we go. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And we'll jump down to verse 20. This, yeah, verse 20. You, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear hitting even the garment stained with the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before his presence, the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, would you help us today? Lord, I would love to be closer to you. And I bet many in here would. Lord, we've got habits that keep us from that. We've got beliefs and hang-ups that keep us from that. But Lord, I thank you that what isn't keeping us from that is you. You have done everything to draw us near. So that the book of James can say, if we draw near to you, you draw near to us. So Lord, help us today to learn what it means to fight, to contend for closeness with you, God. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, 
as I mentioned earlier, it sounds a little weird to say, let, let's contend to be close, because we tend to have a very romanticized vision of what a relationship with God would be like. Heck, we have a really romanticized vision of what a relationship is, right? You know, love isn't a thing you do. You, it's something you fall into. You're just walking along and then, oh, I don't know, right? As if it's got its own G-force to it. Um, and the reason that you fall in love is because eventually, um, you know, that wears off and you stand up and you dust yourself off and you realize, I'm in love with a human sinner. And then, then, my friends, then you need to contend. Then you need to contend because every relationship, everything about the human life and about the human soul has built in within it this kind of entropy, this, this occlusion with the second law of thermodynamics except just for the soul. Entropy is this interesting physical law which basically means everything is spinning out to its most basic form in the universe, okay? Heat dies away, energy goes away, and your soul and the, that excitement that you feel about the Bible or that excitement that you feel about God or that excitement that you feel because it's the new year and this is going to be the year that you whatever that is also subject to the second law that is also subject to soul entropy and so if we approach our relationship with god as the aforementioned barca lounger where we're just going to sit in his grace and then all of a sudden we're going to wake up and like god's just going to be snuggly it it just won't happen because you will not have contended for it you won't have, have done anything that builds closeness with relationships. And if you have ever had a relationship with another human that is of any worth at all, you know you've got to contend for that thing. You know, look, I, I love my wife, and she loves me, but all of us have married a sinner except her. And she, <laughs> she did not laugh in the first service when she saw me say that. She was like, you know, lying from the pulpit is still lying. Um, <clears throat> No, you, you, all relationships involve contending for closeness. There is no deep intimacy. There is no deep anything. There is no anything worth actually having without contending for that thing. And so if you think that you're going to just come close to God because you showed up at church, or even because you show up at church and a group, ooh, we appreciate your attendance. Thank you. But you're going to have to contend just attend. You're going to have to contend for closeness. And so, you say, well, pastor, look, it's hard. You know, it's not the Christian culture that it used to be. And I love the mythology of our Christian culture. It's great. <clears throat> because back in the day, it was super easy when they crucified you for it. Um, yeah. That's sarcasm. If you're new, it's a tool I use often. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it wasn't easy. Jude would have been writing after the dispersion, the diaspora, the, the moment where you know, persecution hit the church like a ton of bricks and then everybody went boom all over the Mediterranean. It wasn't easy. And so Jude begins by writing, Beloved, that's you. Mm. Beloved, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, comma, Typically, that's what we most like to do in church. Like, listen, I want to go to church, and I want to sing songs about how I'm saved, and I want to hear a message about how I'm saved, and then I want to go to a group, eat somebody's cookies that they brought, let's talk about how we're saved, and then let's go home and be saved. And um, unfortunately, that's not the only thing we're doing because we're in a world that is contending against us, right? So part of that soul entropy happens because any kind of kindling fire that you have as a passion for God will quickly be sucked out in the vacuous atmosphere of the world. So, what must we do? Well, Jude says, I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And so if we're going to contend for closeness with God, it involves contending in at least four ways, and I want to show you the first one. The first is contending in the text. You've got to contend. If you want to be close to God, you've got to be contending in the text. And for some of you, you're like, no, I'm out. I'm out. No. Have you ever read Leviticus? I'm out. Right. I know, you've started a New Year Bible reading plan, and you're in the narratives of creation today. It's all fine. Just wait till you get to Deuteronomy, right? Then we'll see who's got mud tires to drive through that, all right? 
it takes contending in the text because these are presumably God's words. And when we receive God's words, we must receive them, if you want to be close to him, as his actual words. Listen, if, if my wife and I were going to be close, but I, I thought that a lot of what she said to me was a lie or no longer applicatory to my life, we wouldn't be very close. That'd make date night awkward if I thought much of what she said was a lie or lost in translation. I mean, there are sometimes inches, miles, an entire cell phone network between her words and mine. Surely her words are getting mangled. I better, I, you know what, I better interpret them the way I hope she means them. That'll make our relationship awesome. So that when she says, hey, Adam, don't say that because I don't like it, what she really means is, hey, Adam, keep saying that because I like it. <laughs> Does sound familiar? It's called reader-driven reading. And it's adorable. And people get PhDs in it. It's also hilariously misguided in the scope of human history. Because for as long as we've been reading stuff, it's only been a couple of decades now where we've decided, actually, all of the meaning in the text lies with me. And I'll get to read it and make of it what I want. We are told by Jude to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. How was that faith once for all delivered to the saints? It was written down. It was written. It, it, it was written down. And the writing, according to the writing itself, was inspired by God. Inspiration means that God breathed his spirit into the text itself. He actually was there colluding with the author. So it sounds like Paul and God at the same time. It sounds like Jesus and Moses and Jeremiah and Isaiah and all of the other authors of the text, because God was using them and with them to bring them exactly where he wanted them to go with their pen. If you want to be close to God, you have to draw close to this text. And when you draw close to the text, listen, you're going to find some stuff in it that you don't like. There's a friend of mine, Pastor Rice, likes to answer the objection, well, I, I don't like the the Bible, because it's filled with contradictions. He says, yes, it contradicts the way you live and the way you spend your money and what you do with your body. Yeah, all kinds of contradictions. Here, let's keep going. <laughs> you don't think that's funny. Um, probably because it maybe contradicts you. Right? And we read the text and we're like, no, I love what it says about, I mean, I love this. And this, this is my favorite. He, if you come and tell me this, this is how I know you've never read the Bible. Uh, listen, I love Jesus' ethics. But just not as others. Have you ever read Jesus' ethics? Have you ever tried to do any of them? Best of luck. Best of luck. Jesus was like, hey, you know, Moses made some things for divorce, but uh, here's what I say. If you look at anyone lustfully, um, you've committed adultery. Good luck. Like, good luck. Just with that one, all of you are going to hell. Like, all of you. All of you. And if for some other reason you're not, let's just keep reading the Sermon on the Mount, Okay. No, you're going to read in this text, and you're going to find stuff in there that is like, ooh, that's hard. When things are hard relationally, pull close. Don't push away. Pull close. This is just great friendship advice, marriage advice, parenting advice. When one party is finding it hard, don't grab them by the collar and draw them close. Grab this text. Grab it with someone else. Grab it with someone who's been with it a little bit longer than you. Maybe, maybe grab a commentary on it. Go get a study Bible, for goodness sakes. Figure out, like, this is really hard, because I'll bet you're not the first person to go, ooh, I don't like that. Right? Some of it you're going to love. Some of it you're going to find really challenging. If you want to be close to God, you've got to draw near and be close. Contend for closeness with the text. Typically, what keeps us from doing this is just straight-out unbelief. Cynicism, but mostly autonomy. Mostly at the bottom of all the both highfalutin and nonfalutin objections to the text go like this. I want to read it the way I want to read it. And I don't want to read it that way. I'm going to be Lord over the text. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to do a little folding and bending. And I'm going to get it to be the way I see. And as long as I cut out forever, amen, that's all I got. I can do that, <laughs> you know. And we do that. That's called autonomy. 
self-law. It's not the way you're supposed to read your Bible. It's not the way God's word has ever worked. God didn't speak into the void and the void talk back and go, no, like I didn't do that. <laughs> so you can't either, and neither can I. And listen, I just, I don't know what you think it's like for me when I read my Bible because there's this belief that like when you put the word pastor in front of your name, God just kind of, oh, there's lots of that. <clears throat> um, no, there's definitely stuff in here that I go, I don't want to preach that. Um, no. <laughs> and, and, and I have to contend. Join me. It's worth it. It's worth it because the one who, who inspired this text is worth it. He's worth knowing. If you want to be close to God, you've got to contend, and you've got to contend in the text. We were never meant to be lords of the text. The text was meant to be lord of us. We're not to be over-readers. We're meant to be under-readers. Contend for closeness in the text, too. Contend for closeness in the spirit. Now, this is interesting. And, and I started with the first one because the second one, you often will get, like, people who, oh, close to the spirit. Well, here's what the Lord told me to do. And what he told you to do happens to be something entirely, <laughs> entirely contradicted by the text. So we're going to contend for closeness to God by contending for closeness in the text. But the second point is we're going to contend for cl closeness with God by contending for closeness with the Holy Spirit going to contend for closeness with the Holy Spirit. After Jude admonishes his readers to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, toward the end we read this, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Praying. What is praying? Well, praying is communion and communication with God. It's not just delivering your Santa Claus wish list to him. It's you talking to him and being open and vulnerable and authentic and real and all those things you think social media gives you the way you're supposed to be in prayer to God. And then taking a moment to listen and going, God, I'm terrified about this. I'm hopeful about this. I really want this. I'm scared you're going to take that. Here's, here I am. And then God speaks back. I say, remember what, we, what I wrote? Remember what I said? We're going to contend for closeness by praying in the Holy Spirit. And praying in the Holy Spirit isn't simply, now I lay me down to sleep. Isn't simply, you know, walking around and saying the Our Father, right? It's, it's talking to God and then listening to what he might say. Because according to the text, the text says that Jesus has come and lived perfect human life, died in our place for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and that's really good news for us because he sent, as he ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit no longer to just dwell behind a curtain in a temple in the Middle East, but to dwell in your hearts through faith. And if that's true, and it is, then that means that that same Holy Spirit who inspired the authors of the text is now living on the inside of you and in the church to understand it and apply it and draw near to the God behind it. That's very good. That's very good. But you don't only want to draw near to God in the text. You want to draw near to God in the text pleading with the Holy Spirit to make it live. To do what he promises to do and illuminate it. I mean, Jesus said in John that he would send the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. That's a massive promise. That's a massive promise. But if you want to, you know, keep that from happening, uh, typically the biggest thing that keeps us from really experiencing spiritual closeness to God is just sin. Just lose your temper. Just... I mean, getting a good cuss and rage in traffic. It's really easy to do here. Right? Just get real, real, real judgy. Not like making good judgments, but like, you know, duck, duck, damned kind of judgy. Right? Just sin. Just do with your body what you want. You know, go on a big, you know, binge of some sort. And the dove will fly away. You won't lose your salvation, Christian. That's not what it means. He'll just feel a million miles away because the Holy Spirit doesn't draw near to where he doesn't like. And isn't it interesting that at Jesus' baptism, he went under the waters and he was brought back out. The Spirit landed upon him like a dove. He said, I like it here. The more we look like Jesus, the more he likes it here. So it's, there's this weird dynamic of chicken or the egg, 
which is the Spirit enables our Christ-likeness and really likes it. So if you want to contend for closeness, contend for closeness not just in the text, but in the Spirit. That means you're going to actually have to pray and not just in exams, students. (laughs) Right? I know every university becomes a prayer furnace two times a year, right? Or a semester. Even the humanist club, our father. <laughs> yeah, I get it. No, 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 no. Pray. You're going you're gonna to have to, like, like, I have to calendar prayer. You say, that's sad. I say, I know, but I still have to do it. <laughs> I have to calendar everything. I have to say, okay, here's when I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to, you know, and then my alarm gets me up, and it says, prayer. And, uh, oh, yeah, prayer. And then I have to do it, because I have all these people that I made, and they get up early. And if I'm going to be any good for them, I need to talk to Jesus first, frankly. <laughs> and then you have all these people, you know, like your roommates or your workmates or your spouse or your kids, that if you're going to be any good to them, you better talk to Jesus and draw near to him and pray. You're going to have to make that happen. You're going to have to make that happen. And can I give you some advice, not in the script today? When you pray, quit looking for every day to be like a close encounter of the third kind, Right? Do you get this aged movie reference? The one's even before my time, but okay. Pastor Donnie, I appreciate your head nod. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's not just going to be like just beaming down, just boo, you know, everything. Mm, it's going to be ama- like, but I tell you what, you do that every day for, say, a hundred days in a row, and all of a sudden, you're just going to find yourself hearing God. You're just going to know, I need to stop and talk to him. And that person that you're normally rude and short with at work, you're going to go, She's hurting. It's just going to happen. If you want to contend for closeness with God, contend for closeness in the Holy Spirit, prayer, meditation, fasting. We're going to fast at the end of this month. And I always love that announcement because people are like, again? (laughs) Great. I love not eating. Yeah. We're going to fast. We're going to pray together because we've got to contend for closeness. Three, contend for closeness in the church. Oh, man. Have, uh, it says here, uh, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God. Keeping yourselves. Um, the you there, second person plural, y'all, right? And I'm going to write to a Bible publisher and see if they'll publish a Southern English Standard Version at some point. I actually think it would be really helpful because you think, oh, I should contend. Not, not just you, but you all. We all have to keep in love with one another. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God, which means if we're going to contend for closeness with God, not only do we contend in the text and in the spirit, but we've got to contend in the church, which means I've got to keep liking you. And you've got to keep liking them. And like, I know, I know, I know. Like, we've got to do that. You can't, you can't expect to be close to God and drag around all of your, well, it was my birthday and no one called me and they didn't Facebook high five me, which is how you know, how you know, <laughs> right? Well, I walked out of church and no one invited me. I hate this place, right? Like you can't, you can't, you can't just do that. You're going to have to contend for closeness in the church. That means with these people, with these other fallen, messed up human Dumpster fires, but beautiful, right? Oh, too real? I'm sorry. You're lovely. You look great today. Um, th- that's who we are. That's who we are. Like, we're beautiful, but we're a mess. Thus, Jesus. Let's go back on the podcast. You'll get it. You've got to contend to love one another, which is hard, which means you, if you're going to go to a group, and you should, you should get in one of our like three dozen groups we have going on right now, but if you're going to go, let me just tell you how it's going to go. You're going to go for the first time, you're going to be like, that was really awkward. I had to go to someone's house I've never been to and eat their bad cookies, unless you go to Jana's group, never bad cookies, <laughs> never bad cookies at Pastor Donnie's wife's groups, right? And like, it was weird, and I, yeah, once you get past that though, for like two, three, four, six weeks, and you actually see they're fallen to you see fallen you needs to know that fallen them has been also redeemed by Jesus and he can speak to them and he can speak to you and sometimes he wishes to speak to you through them do you know the two most common ways i hear jesus is through my wife 
and right now through Pastor Donnie. I know. <laughs> it's just true. Because, because I love my brother, and he loves me, and he will speak truth to me. And he'll tell me what God tells him about me. And vice versa. And now I'm close to him because I'm close to him and close to her and close to you. And you can be close to him by being close to one another because it's the same thing. That's why Jesus said, if you want to love God, you better love people because they're kind of connected. They're kind of connected. And listen, by love people, I don't want to mean like, oh, well, I give to Oxfam. Okay, that's not, no, that doesn't count. I love people. Social justice. No, that's not what I mean. That's great, but that's not what I mean. I mean a real life human person that you know, like their name, their whole name. Got to contend for closeness in the church, which means you're going to have to be vulnerable. This is typically where my men, we check out because someone from the stage drops a word like intimate. And we're like, I don't want to be intimate. I don't like that word. I get it. But you're going to have to be like vulnerable to allow yourself to be known and to know. But do you know you're only going second there because Jesus went first? Your God hung naked on a cross and died for nine hours vulnerable. Draw near. Draw near. Draw near to one another and say, hey, listen, I'm doing great here, but this area, I really need help. I was on the phone uh, this past week with a brother of mine, not like a physical brother, but uh, another follower of Jesus who was just trying so hard, fighting with all of his might against lust. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I find at the end of my my conversation with my friend was that he has no friends. No one really knows him. He's completely isolated, even though he goes to a church. You can do that. You can show up and not be known. Don't do that. If you want to contend for closeness with God, you better contend with, for closeness with one another. It's hard, it's messy, it's risky, and it's 100% worth it. It's 100% worth it. And finally... Contending for closeness on the mission. We are not here just to snuggle up, right? Hallelujah. Um, we are not here just to be together and have life together and do community and all those other kind of Christian-y sounding things. We are here to know and be known so that we can make known the faith that was delivered to us, to actually bring the truth and show the grace of the gospel to a hostile world. And that means we can't just assume it's going to happen. We Part of the reason you cannot go along with the automatic entropic nature of your soul is because they need you to be blazing hot for Christ. The world is not helped when you're like, oh... They don't really like Jesus, I better like him less. That's not helpful. They're helped when you love him, when you know him, when you are known by him. When you look more like him. They're helped when I look more like him. We've got to contend for closeness on the mission. He says this, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh. What does that mean? Well, I love what he says here because what it does is it kind of rebukes our extremes. The first he says, have mercy on those who doubt. Some of you in our church, I love you because like you've never sinned almost, right? Like you were just kind of born, you love Jesus, you kind of went to Sunday school, you don't remember when you decided to follow Christ because you just always have. And that's awesome. I want you to know, I'm not making fun of that. I pray for that story for my kids every day. I love that story. But sometimes when, when you've kind of been conditioned and grown up in the church, you look at the sinners, right? And you, you're merciless on those who doubt. And yet people come to this text and they've got legitimate doubts and fears and concerns because they realize, some of you realize, you don't want to read this book because you know as soon as you start believing this is actually God's word, you're going to have to change your life. It's going to cost you something. And so, as a defense mechanism, your fallen nature is like, uh, doubt, 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 mm. yeah, because of those, even those, though those aren't very good. We have to have patience, patience, patience with those who doubt. Some of you, I love you, but you come out, and you are armed to the teeth with truth, 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 truth shells, 
right? Truth tattoos, truth. Boop, 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 right? You're going to go all Rambo truth on somebody. You know who you are. You utilize the social medias, right? If I just lob this out there, everyone will change. Stop doing that. Right? Truth, truth, truth. Sometimes just put down the weapon, right? Have a coffee. What happens to be your problem with the tech? Like, just ask a question. Ask a question. Have patience with those who doubt. Most of you aren't that way, though, and so Jude is going to get on to you, too. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Most of you, when I read that, went, you winced. You're like, well, surely that's just hyperbole. No, it's not. No, it's save others by snatching them out of the fire, and the fire there is hell. Some of you are in here by the skin of your teeth. Like, you were, you were redeemed. Someone grabbed you and said, you will not live this way any longer. You were this close to death. You were this close to ruining your life. You were this clo- that addiction was about to overtake you. That thing was about to eat you. And someone, somehow, God and Spirit, something happened and grabbed you and saved you as someone being snatched from a fire. And some of you, you need that. Many of us need to be a little bit more deliberate on the mission. And draw close enough to someone so that we could actually reach them. And So listen, I love you, but this is going to ruin your life and send you to hell forever. Do you actually love anyone enough to tell, you, to tell them that? Furthermore, does anyone know you enough to tell you that? And then he comes and brings it into balance. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. What he means there is, look, show mercy but not at the expense of the fear of the Lord. And fear the Lord, but not at the expense of mercy. It's both of these things. That's why we really like to talk about grace and truth. Grace and truth. Show grace, absolutely. But you better tell the truth. Tell the truth filled with grace. Because that's what Jesus is like. And the closer you come to him, the more you do that. The more you do that. Do you see what's at stake here at our closeness? Our closeness is not just something like, well, it'd be really nice to be close to God. The more we draw near to God, the closer we are to him, the better we are at this. So, my fellow Bostonian goal-setting types. You come, we're in the new year, set your goals. Contend. Contend for closeness with God. Don't be distracted by other things to contend for. It's an election year. So yeah, holding our church together in, a, in an election year is like playing, what's that game? Yeah, it's like that, except, except being pulled apart by horses, donkeys and elephants and stuff. Yeah, it's a very exciting because half of you convinced the other half are dead wrong and going to go to hell, and then the other half of you, likewise. Don't, don't make that your contention, please. Or at least not your main one. You better contend for closeness with God. We better, listen, we better, that's why we were brought here. To draw near to God and near to a world that really needs people who've been drawn near to God. That's what your campus needs. That's what your office needs. That's certainly what your living room needs. Kitchen table needs. It's what you need. Contend for closeness with God. And as you contend for closeness with God, I love this. He blesses us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Do you get that? Like mental picture that for a minute. God is able to keep you from messing this thing up and to, in the end, present you to himself in all of his glory with great joy. That is, if you contend for closeness with God, in the end, you get it. And it's better than you imagine. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever.